I've been thinking for a while about what I would preach this morning. And there was one story in the Bible that kept coming back to mind. It's not one I've preached before, but I have alluded to it and referenced it on several occasions. It's the story of Joseph in Genesis. Now, this story does span like 12 or 13 chapters, so we're not going to hunker down into one passage like I normally do. Uh, we're not going to read the entire story this morning. I'm going to tell it. We're going to read snippets from it. Uh, but I would encourage you this week, go home, read the whole story for yourself, be thinking about what we've talked about this morning, and sort of let that inform the way you read. Let God show you things that either I chose not to talk about or we just had to skip over today because we only have so much time. Uh, read it for yourself. It sounds like a lot, 12, 13 chapters. It's, you can do it in one sitting, maybe two. It's not that bad. You'll be all right. Uh, this story really resonated with me for reasons that I think will become obvious, uh, and I think it will resonate with many of you. Now, to tell this story, I suppose you have to begin in the beginning. Jacob is living in the land of Canaan, where his father and grandfather lived before him. His grandfather, of course, is Abraham, who I'm told Pastor Don has talked about quite a bit this summer. Now, God has promised this land of Canaan to Abraham and has told him that in this land, he's going to become a great nation. And Jacob certainly has quite the family going on. He has 12 sons from four different women, two wives and two servants. You thought your blended family was complicated. <laughs> Now, of all of these sons, there was one son that Jacob favored more than all the others, and his name was Joseph. Joseph was one of his youngest, one of the two youngest, from his favorite wife. And Jacob had him late in his life, so he developed this special bond with him. He got special treatment. It was pretty obvious he got special treatment. And everybody knew that his dad liked him more than all the others. I think right now, Pabe is a little jealous of our new puppy, Vinny, because he thinks that we love him more than we love him. Pabe, I'll just pat up the corner, and Vinny will come cuddle up next to him. But so Jacob has this special relationship with Joseph, and he demonstrates it through a gift. He gives him this special robe. Now, most translations call it a robe of many colors, there's a musical, Joseph in the Technicolor green coat, right? But the more research we do, the more scholars think that that actually means something else. That it wasn't a robe with many colors, that it was a robe with long sleeves. Now that sounds way less exciting. <laughs> and it's certainly way less fun for kids to color in Sunday school, right? But it has a specific meaning. See, a robe with long sleeves, it's hard to do manual labor with that, right? Whenever you're going to do something, we say, I've got to roll up my sleeves. Maybe you literally roll up your sleeves, because sleeves get in the way. And especially if they're robe sleeves, right? They're loose and they're hanging. There's a reason why the nature boy Ric Flair took his robe off before he wrestled. It's going to get in the way. You can't do anything with that. And so the only people who are wearing long sleeve robes are the people that don't do the work in the field. So it's like if you go to a retail store, right? And you see all the employees and they're walking around in like bright colored polos. But the manager's walking around in a white dress shirt. This robe works sort of the same way. Long sleeves, long robe. Says, I'm not labor, I'm management. And so his dad gives him this. Meanwhile, his brothers go out and work in the field. You'd be a little resentful too. His brothers hate this special treatment. And not only that, we're told that Joseph gives a bad report of them to their father. He towels on them. So first he gets the special robe, now he's ratting them out. So they hated him. They couldn't say a single peaceful word to him. Now, I don't know what the Hebrew is for snitches get stitches. <laughs> Maybe Pastor Don knows his Hebrew is better than mine. But they may have used it. They may have used it. And so we start here with these characters in this setting. And this is what the Bible says next. In Genesis 37, verse 5. 
It says, now Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheep. <laughs> his brothers said to him, are you indeed to reign over us? Or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream, and he told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. <laughs> Behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream that you've dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. Now it's interesting there, because already his brothers hate him, and now he's like, I have these dreams. And they're like, we're going to kill this kid. <laughs> he's 17 at this point, and he's showing all of the wisdom and self-awareness that we all had at that age. Which is not a lot. But Jacob has a different reaction. Sure, he rebukes him, but he keeps it in mind. He thinks there might just be something to this dream. Later, Jacob tells Joseph, go check on your brothers who are doing work out in the field. They're pasturing the sheep. Now, we know that his brothers hate his guts. They do not like this kid. So when we read that Jacob wants Joseph to go find them just out in a field somewhere, even if we don't know where the story goes, it should put a little pit in our stomach. We don't want Joseph to find them. Like, what's going to happen? This might go real poorly for him. And so tension builds, but thankfully he gets to where they're supposed to be, and they're not there. Whew! Joseph gets out of this one, right? In verse 15, it says he's just wandering through the fields. That is, until a random dude sees Joseph wandering in the fields and asks him what he's looking for. And it just so happens that this guy knows who his brothers are, and it just so happens that this guy heard his brothers say where they were going. And so he's able to, oh yeah, Jacob's boys, yeah, yeah, sure, I heard they're going to Dothan. So the story takes place in Alabama. I'm just kidding. <laughs> now, this is a completely random chance encounter on the surface. Like, what are the odds that Joseph's walking through a field and he bumps into the one guy that overhears his brother say where they're going? and that can direct in there that he'll be able to find them. Like, we've got a big field next to the church here. You go wandering through it, you will find no one who can tell you where your family members are, right? <laughs> like, what are the odds of this? How is this even possible? But sometimes God sets up these random encounters, and they're not so random after all. It reminds me of this guy that went to the church I served at in D.C., we didn't own a church building in D.C. We owned the largest freestanding coffee house in Washington, D.C. It's called Ebenezer's. And down in the basement of Ebenezer's, we would do service every Saturday night. And one Saturday night, this guy shows up to the coffee house just to have coffee, and he hears something that you don't expect to hear in a coffee house. Not music, because you might expect to hear music. Not someone speaking, because that wouldn't be that out of the ordinary. He walks in. He's sitting there, he's sipping his coffee, and he hears splashing. And he goes, what? Is there like a pool in the basement? Like, what is going on here? And he walks down the stairs, and he gets into the basement, and he sees not a pool, but a baptismal. We're having a baptismal service in the basement of the coffee house. So he walks in, and he decides to stay. Later... He decides to come back. Later, he makes the biggest decision and gives his life to Jesus. God completely changes 
this guy's life because he walks into a coffee house and just so happens to hear splashing and checks it out. See, the things that seem random on the outside sometimes turn out to be divine appointments. And so it is with Joseph here. God is determined that he find his brothers in this field. But what's going to happen to him when he does? In verse 18, it says, They saw him from afar, and before he came near to them, they conspired to kill him. They said to one another, Here comes this dreamer. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him, and we will see what becomes what will become of his dreams. As he's walking up, his brothers are plotting his murder. Joseph probably has no idea. Now, I have nothing to support this, but his complete lack of social awareness earlier makes me think that he walks up on this completely aloof. Like, hey, brothers, I'm so glad to have found you. Feels like a very little brother thing to do. We see that with Vinny and Pepe. Vinny just can't understand why. I keep trying to bite Pepe on the ear, and he doesn't like me. I don't know why. But you can tell with them the dream's still bugging him. Oh, here comes this dreamer. Well, let's see what becomes of those dreams when we kill him and dump him in a well. And the oldest brother, Reuben, he's the voice of reason here. He convinces the brothers, hey, let's not kill him. Let's just throw him in the well. Let's not kill him and throw him in the well. Let's just throw him in the well. And Reuben's plan is, look, we'll throw him in. Everybody will be happy. I'll come back later, I'll pull him out of the well, I'll bring him home to dad. He'll learn his lesson, everything will be all right. Now, he's not going to stand up for Joseph completely here, because I'm sure he's a little peeved too, but he doesn't want to see his brother get killed. So the brothers are convinced, Joseph gets to him, they jump him, they rip his fancy robe off, and they chuck him into this well. Now, the Bible tells us that pretty matter-of-factly, like, and they threw him into a well. But how, Right? These things could be 20, 30, 40 feet deep. And we're told that the well's dry. So he just falls the whole way, hits mud and rocks, just splat. And then there are these big stones that they cover the openings with so you don't get you know, dust and who knows what in your water. And so they toss him in, presumably, cover him up with the stone. And so he's just laying there in this cistern. Then, the brothers sit down and eat. (laughs) They've apparently worked up an appetite doing all of this. Things could be worse for Joseph, but things could be a lot better. He's in this well, but Reuben has his plan. He heads off and says, I'll come back later, and I'll pull him out. But just then, it just so happens that a caravan approaches from the distance. Chapter 37, still verse 26. It says, Then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. Then Midianite traders passed by, and they drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit, and sold him to the Ishmaelites for twenty shekels of silver. They took Joseph to Egypt. So a caravan just so happens to be passing by. This divine appointment for Joseph is with slavers. And now we hear Judah and we think righteousness, right? Jesus was from the tribe of Judah. The tribe of Judah, they stayed on the straight and narrow a little better than the other tribes did when the kingdom gets divided later on. Here, we see their patriarch, Judah, making a pretty messed up argument. Like, hey, we don't get any money if we kill him. Let's sell him. (laughs) He's our brother after all, right? (laughs) Let's sell him into slavery. And we see here Judah is the best arguer in the family by far. And he's able to convince his brothers here, and we'll see him later on use his powers for both good and evil. And so they pull Joseph out of the pit. They sell him into slavery. 
And Reuben comes back and he sees what's happened and he freaks out. He tears his clothes. He mourns. What is he going to do now? Joseph's gone. His plan is ruined. And the brothers realize, look, we got to cover up this death somehow. So they take a goat. They kill it. They grab Joseph's coat. They rub it in the goat's blood. They take it back to their dad. And they're like, look, an animal must have got him. There's all this blood on his coat. Jacob gets it and he's just devastated. This was his favorite son. And now he's dead, and Jacob is just heartbroken. And meanwhile, Joseph is taken all the way to Egypt, and he's sold as the captain of the guard, a man named Potiphar. With that title, he's probably an army leader or something like that. And while Joseph's working for Potiphar, the Lord is with him, and he blesses everything that he does. In Genesis chapter 39, skipping ahead here, verse 3, it says, his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him, and he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all he, that he had. So the Lord causes Joseph to be successful, and Potiphar takes notice of this. He ends up getting control of Potiphar's entire house. Everything I've got, all my possessions, it's all you, Joseph. You take care of it. So Potiphar doesn't have to worry about anything except the food he puts in his mouth. Like that's his only concern, because Joseph's so good, he can trust him so much. So Joseph's not exactly in the place he'd choose to be right now, but things are going pretty good considering, Right? He's successful, he's doing all right for himself. He might not be completely free, but he might be someday. He's got quite a bit of freedom in this role. He's got responsibility. Things are looking good. They could be a lot worse. Now, at this point in the story, we learn a little detail about Joseph that we haven't read in this, until this point. And it's that Joseph is a good-looking dude. He's got this Jewish Ryan Gosling thing going on. He's attractive, he's well-built, and we're made to notice this here because someone else notices at this point, Potiphar's wife. Potiphar's wife sees Joseph and is bound and determined to get him in the sack. And so every day she's pestering him, and every day Joseph turns her down. Finally, one day she catches him in the house all alone. She gets a little forceful. She grabs him by the shirt and says, lay with me, sleep with me. Now, in 1 Corinthians, Paul tells the church, flee from sexual immorality. Joseph here does that literally. He slips out of his shirt and books it out the front door. He literally runs from sexual immorality right out of the house, just leaves the shirt and bolts. And now Potiphar's wife is pretty upset. She's enraged that she's been rejected like this by this servant. And she can't believe what's happened, but she's got his shirt. And so she calls all the other male servants and accuses Joseph of trying to rape her. He came in and he took his shirt off and he tried to force himself on me and then I yelled and he ran away. And so she tells them all that story and then when Potiphar gets home, she tells him the same story as well, down in verse 17. And she told him the same story, saying, the Hebrew servant whom you have brought among us came in to laugh at me. But as soon as I lifted my voice and cried, he left his garment beside me and fled out of the house. As soon as his master heard the words that his wife spoke to him, this is the way your servant treated me, his anger was kindled. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in prison. Now what's interesting here is that Joseph, what's happened here has angered Potiphar, but he doesn't have Joseph killed. A foreign a Think about it. A foreign servant tries to rape the wife of an important military figure. In that day, that guy, he's donezo. Like, you're not surviving that. There's no way. But Joseph does, which is interesting. And I think what that tells us is that I don't think Potiphar believes his wife's story. I don't know if she has a reputation. 
I mean, this is probably not the first time this has happened. And then the way that she says it, right? She's like, your servant, the guy you brought in here, Potiphar. So she's kind of blaming him. And so Potiphar's kind of like, woman? (laughs) And so he has to do something, because he can't just do nothing. It'll bring shame on his house. So instead of killing Joseph, he has him thrown in the royal prison. And so now there's Joseph. Now he's in jail for a crime he didn't commit. Lemony Snicket's got nothing on Joseph's series of unfortunate events here. But then the craziest thing happens, down in verse 21. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. So God is with Joseph and he manages to prosper him in prison. The jailkeeper puts him in charge of the other prisoners. It says he didn't even know what Joseph was doing, didn't he? That's a terrible way to be a warden. you got to check up on that. Okay, you can't just let that go. But he doesn't even worry. He doesn't even care. Hey, Joseph, he's got it. I trust this guy. The Lord is with him. And two new prisoners come in one day, and Joseph's getting them checked in, getting them accommodated. And he finds out that it's the king's cupbearer and the king's baker. So he's talking to these guys, gets to know them, and then one night they have these dreams, and they don't know what they mean, and they're, they're bothered by these dreams. And Joseph is like, oh, really? Well, I mean, all interpretations belong to God, so, man, tell me the dreams, and I'll see if he'll tell me the interpretation. And so the cupbearer tells Joseph his dream, because there's these three branches And they produce these grapes, and I take the grapes, and I squeeze the grapes into a cup, and I give the cup to Pharaoh. What do you think that means? Joseph goes, oh, the three branches, those are three days. And in three days, you're going to be restored. Pharaoh's going to lift up your head and restore you to your place as his cupbearer. And then Joseph says this to the cupbearer. He says, Only remember me when it is well with you, and please do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh, and so get me out of this house. For I was stolen out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also I have done nothing that they should put me into the pit. And so the cupbearer agrees, wants wants him to help, Joseph wants him to help get out of prison. And then the baker gets excited I was like, cool, Joseph, do me, do me. So I had this dream where I've got these three baskets on my head, and then this bird was eating like bread and cookies and stuff out of the top basket. And Joseph goes, okay, in three days, Pharaoh's going to lift your head up off your body. You're going to die. I'm barely exaggerating. That's how Joseph tells this guy. Like, I don't know if you would call it like bedside manner with dream interpretation, but Joseph's got a little work to do here, right? He's prospering. The Lord's with him. He's still kind of a jerk. (laughs) And so sure enough, three days later, the events happen exactly like he predicted. The cupbearer is restored. The baker is hanged. Unfortunately for Joseph, though, the cupbearer forgets all about him. The Bible says for two whole years the cupbearer doesn't remember him. Now, two years in prison is no joke, but we can do the math on this story and realize that Joseph spends 13 years either in slavery or in prison. 13 years. This is a long way from those dreams he was having back home. And I'm sure there's a lot of why questions for Joseph here. Like, God, if you have this plan for me to be this great thing that everyone's bowing down to, why am I stuck in prison? If God has such a plan for my life, why am I here? Two years go by, the cupbearer hasn't even remembered him. 
But everything changes for Joseph when one night Pharaoh has a couple dreams that he can't understand. And so he calls all of his magicians and all of his wise men, tells them to dream, and they have no idea. We got nothing, boss. And so the dream we find out is he sees seven plump cows, and then seven thin cows come and eat the plump cows. And then seven ears of grain rise up that are nice and plump. And then seven thin, weird ears of grain pop up and eat the seven plump ears of grain. And Pharaoh's bothered by it, and he can't figure out what it means. And finally, the cupbearer hears him talking about this and is like, oh, I screwed up. I got a guy. (laughs) I know a guy. And so they go and they drag Joseph out of prison, and they bring him to Pharaoh. And he tells Pharaoh the same thing. Look, God can answer this. Tell me the dream. And so Pharaoh does, and Joseph tells him, look, they're two dreams, but they mean the same thing. There's going to be seven years of plenty and then seven years of famine. And you can bank on that. So this is what you need to do. You need to find somebody who's really wise and have them store up food during the seven years of plenty so that then in the seven years of famine, you can sell that food to the people that need it now. And Pharaoh's like, that's a pretty good idea. He's impressed. And so this is what he says in Genesis 41 now, verse 37, jumping down. This proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find a man like this, and whom is the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has shown you all this, there is none so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards the throne will I be greater than you. Joseph goes from being sold into slavery to prison to the number two guy in all of Egypt. He is vice pharaoh. (laughs) This is the ultimate rags to riches story here. He gets power. He gets a signet ring from pharaoh, which is basically pharaoh's signature. He can sign off on anything. He punches it in, and they have to do it. He gets wealth. He gets all kinds of clothes and jewelry. He's married into this really important family, so he's got status. Pharaoh gives him chariots. They're like the limos of the day, but with way fewer horsepower. (laughs) Life is good for Joseph. He has these two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And this is what he says. It says, Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh for... He said, God has made me forget all my hardship and all my father's house. The name of the second he called Ephraim, for God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. Those names are both puns, basically. There are a lot of puns in the Bible, because puns are a good and godly form of humor. (laughs) Manasseh sounds a lot like the Hebrew for making to forget. Ephraim sounds a lot like the Hebrew for making fruitful. And so seven years of plenty go on, and it's great. And then a famine starts, right, as Joseph had predicted. The plan's working exactly as he hoped. Things are going good for Joseph. He's been blessed. But meanwhile, back in Canaan, things are starting to go poorly for his brothers because they're hit with the famine too. And so Jacob finds out, hey, there's food for sale in Egypt, and he sends ten of his boys, leaves his youngest Benjamin back, sends them out to go buy some. And when they go buy food in Egypt, who do they have to talk to? That's right, it's Joseph. And so Joseph recognizes them, but he hides himself from them. He speaks to them through an interpreter. He's wearing all the Egyptian garb and jewelry and everything, They haven't seen him in 20 years at this point. And so he hides his identity, and then he treats them pretty roughly. He gets there, they get there, he accuses them of being spies and has them all thrown in jail. That's just the first of several tests he'll put them through. They get food. He makes them leave one of them behind. Simeon gets left in jail. They can't go back to get Simeon until they come back with Benjamin, the youngest, But Jacob won't let Benjamin go because he's like, I'm not losing both of my favorites, so that's not happening. But finally, the famine gets bad enough that they really need the grain. And so Judah puts his lawyer skills to good here and convinces Jacob to let Benjamin go. 
And so they get there, and Joseph puts them through the biggest test of all. He prepares a meal for all of them, and they all get choice food, choice wine from Joseph's table, but Benjamin gets five times as much as everybody else. See, what he's doing is he's trying to replay the events of his childhood. Let me give Benjamin some special treatment, and let's see how they treat Benjamin. But so far, everything's going good. They're not too jealous of him, or at least they're not showing it. They buy their food. And what Joseph does is he has the steward of his house put Joseph's really fancy silver cup in Benjamin's bag of grain. And they head off, and so Joseph watches them go, and he's sitting there, and he's like, wait for it, wait for it. (laughs) All right, go get them. And so then the steward goes out and catches up to him and goes, hey, we know that one of you guys stole the cup. And the brothers are incredulous. Like, what are you talking about? We wouldn't steal the cup. Why would we steal silver from you? Like, last time we came here, you threw us in jail. Like, get real. We did not steal this from you. You can search all of our stuff. Guy goes, all right. (laughs) And so he starts with Reuben's bag, the oldest. And one by one, he starts opening bags. And so the tension's building. We've got 11 of these to go through. And he goes through Reuben and the next one and the next one and the next one. And finally, the only one left is Benjamin's. And he opens up the bag, and there's the cup. And the brothers tear their clothes. They are just in despair. They pack up their donkeys. They head back to Egypt. And they come before Joseph, and Joseph wants to see, okay, now how are these guys going to respond? How are they going to treat Benjamin? And so Judah, of course, is the spokesman, and he gets up and says, look, all 11 of us, we're your servants now. And Joseph goes, no, no, no just the one with the cup. See, what he's trying to see is, are they going to abandon Benjamin or are they going to stick by him? And Judah goes through the whole tale. Look, we went back. We had to convince my dad. We finally convinced my dad. He tells Joseph everything. Everything about Benjamin not being able to come and how if they don't go back with Benjamin, their dad's going to just die from pain and grief. And so Judah just lays it down. Look, staying or leaving, whatever Benjamin has to do, we're doing too. And Joseph just breaks down in tears. He sends all the Egyptians out of the room, reveals himself to them. They've passed the test. It's like, I'm Joseph. And all of the brothers are just stunned. And their first thought is, well, what happens to us now? Is this guy going to get us? And this is what it says in chapter 45 and verse 4. It says, So Joseph said to his brothers, Come near to me, please. And they came near, and he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will neither be plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on the earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. So Joseph forgives them completely. He asks them, don't be distressed. But notice here, the way that Joseph sees it, it's not them that sent him to Egypt. It was God who sent him to Egypt. God orchestrated all of this so that Joseph would be able to save his family. He knows that the, family's got, the famine has five more years to go, so he wants the whole family to move to Egypt. Everybody come. Jacob, the whole household, you, all your households, come live in Egypt. Pharaoh says, look, we'll give you best land, best stuff from the land. You'll eat off the fat of the land. We'll hook you up. And so Pharaoh gives them provisions for their journey. They head back home. They get Jacob. They start to make the move. And Jacob is a little bit worried because this is the land that God gave his grandfather that they're supposed to stay in. But he has a dream, and in the dream, God tells him, look, I'm with you. Go to Egypt. I'm going to make you a great nation there. And I will restore you. I will bring you back to this land. 
And so they make the move to Egypt. They all go, and things are going great. A short time later, at this point, Jacob is already very, very old. And so he finally dies. And so now the brothers notice that they're here in Egypt with everything. Jacob is gone to protect them. Benjamin's there with Joseph. Joseph is completely free to do whatever he wants to with them. So they get a little worried. And they fake a message to Joseph. They're like, yeah, before dad died, he, uh, he said you had to forgive us. <laughs> <laughs> and then they brace for the worst. What is Joseph going to do to them? And in chapter 50 and verse 19, this is what it says. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear, I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. That is the entire point. That is the thesis of the whole story of Joseph. As a matter of fact, that is the thesis of the whole book of Genesis. As a matter of fact, that is the thesis of the whole story of the Bible. That this was meant for evil, but God has turned it and used it for good. Joseph refuses to retaliate. Instead, he acknowledges God's hand in everything that's happened to him, and he forgives his brothers. God takes evil and turns it to good. And so Joseph's life is the illustration par excellence of that. That's the whole point of the story. What his brothers did to him was heinous. What Potiphar's wife did to him was treacherous. What the cupbearer did to him was regrettable. Yet God was able to take all of those things and use them for his glory. And the truth is, is that God does the same thing in our lives. That no matter what we're going through, God's able to use it for good. Paul says this in Romans 8. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. And so my migraines, my needing to step down this morning, it doesn't catch God by surprise. He doesn't relish me being in pain. He's not excited that we're all sad about this step this morning. But he's able to take it and use it for good. Everything is worked by him for our benefit. And our ultimate good is wrapped up in him. This doesn't mean that all things work for good, which means that, oh, I lost my job, so I'm going to get this even better, tremendous job now. You might not. You might get a worse job next. Your ultimate good means more of Jesus. It means that everything we endure is him shaping us into the person he wants us to be. It's putting into motion what he wants to happen so that we have more of him. And if we knew what God knows, his glory would be our chief concern. That would be the most important thing to us. If we could get a picture of that. It's the reason he created everything, to spread his glory out through his creation. Those qualities that make him who he is, his kindness, his goodness, his love, his beauty, his faithfulness. His, that is what it means for him to spread his glory, is to share those qualities of himself with his creation. And so that means that whatever happens to us is for our good and for his glory. And so someday we'll be able to look back on anything and say, I'm glad that happened. Now, we won't always know why we go through the things we do. That time that we're able to say, I'm glad that happened, that might not be until we're on the other side and we're standing in, on the new earth with this new perspective that he's given us. Sometimes we can see why. Sometimes we go through bad things because we learn from them. 
I learned how to thrive in high pressure situations by being in high pressure situations. There are some skills that you can only learn through experience. You won't be good at first, but you'll get better. You can only learn some lessons through pain. You want to learn to play guitar? You got to be okay with developing some calluses. Sometimes our pain puts us in the right place at the right time. That happens with Joseph. So that he ends up in Egypt at just the right time to be this person that God uses in this incredible way. If he's not sold into slavery, he never winds up there. And so we can go through awful experiences that set us up for divine appointments. We can draw closer to Jesus through our suffering. If you want your faith to grow, you have to be in positions that demand more faith. If you want to trust God more, you have to be in situations that need more trust. Just as Jesus suffered, we share in his sufferings, and it draws us closer to him. But sometimes we won't find out until the other side of eternity why we're going through what we go through. We might be able to see small things, but we'd still think like, you know, if I could do it all over again and I was in control, I, I don't think I'd make that trade. There might be something that God is doing that we can't even see. I notice that Joseph is able to look back and see all that God is doing and what it's led to. Job isn't. The answer Job gets is, well, I'm God and this happened and you just got to trust me. Job goes, Okay. That's the book of Job. <laughs> but it's okay when we go through anything to lament, to cry. It's okay to be sad. It's okay to express those emotions to God. I've been reading the Psalms this summer, specifically all of the lament Psalms. And it's crazy because you'll read things and you're like, oh, you shouldn't talk to God like that. <laughs> Like, it's in the Bible. Psalms is full of it, where there's frustration and mourning and anger expressed. And those are emotions that are healthy, that need to be released. I know we're all good Midwesterners, so that's not our MO usually. We like to just stuff it down, pile cheese on top of it until you don't feel it anymore, right? But God can take it. In fact, he welcomes it. This is what it means to be in relationship with God. If we're in relationship with him, that means that we have to be able to bring our frustrations to him. Otherwise, we're just drones doing the best we can to obey commands. We've got to be able to bring our hurts and our frustrations and our anger to him. And so we can lament, we can grieve, we can bring that to him, and he listens, and he cares. And not only does he listen and care, he identifies. Because God's plan to eliminate suffering isn't, one day I'll wave a magic wand and it'll all go away. God's plan to eliminate suffering starts with him entering his creation and enduring suffering to the highest degree in Jesus on the cross. All the pain, all the suffering in Joseph's story leads directly to Jesus. It's all part of salvation history because if Joseph doesn't get sold into slavery, then Joseph doesn't end up in Egypt and he's not able to provide for his family. And if he's not able to provide for his family, they die out during that famine. And the, God, the promise that God made to Abraham is never fulfilled. If Jacob doesn't have the whole family move to Egypt, then the Israelites are never enslaved in Egypt. And so then God doesn't raise up Moses to lead them out of Egypt. All of it, all of these stories in the Old Testament, they all pave the way to Jesus for when he'll enter creation, suffer and die in our place to make a way for us. Ultimately, Jesus is the better Joseph. He's betrayed by his brothers, and he suffers incredibly so that others might live, not for seven years, but for eternity. And whenever I think about how God can use our pain, I think about the cross. 
Because if God brought about that terrible day, if he was in control of all history leading to that moment, and not only orchestrates that moment, but experiences that moment and endures it, then what is he not in control of? What can he not take and turn around for good? And so I know that God will take this situation and turn and use it for good. I see small things that I've learned from my disability, but if I'm honest, I still don't see the big picture for me. And here lately, I've been confronted with all these stories of people I know or uh, celebrities or people I admire or whatever. There was a musician friend of mine that at one point she had a growth on her vocal cord. She was the worship leader at our church and just absolutely beautiful voice and was told that there's a really good chance we're going to do this surgery and you're never going to sing again. And so she was completely broken. She goes in for the surgery. God does a miracle. She comes out, sings just fine. So now she's learned the lessons of that, but she's been restored. She went through the darkness and she came out the other side. We were watching this show on Netflix the other day about this chef in Chicago that he had cancer on his tongue and it was going to kill him. They actually put out a press release in the newspaper in Chicago saying, hey, Chef Ackett's is going to die, like, but it's okay, the restaurant's going to keep going. And what ends up happening is they put that out and then the University of Chicago sees it and goes, we think we can help. And a surgery he, was suppo- he could have had gave him a 70% chance of dying. And so he just refused because it was going to remove his tongue and part of his neck. And it, he wasn't going to be able to be a chef. It would be a shell of his existence before he didn't want to do it. The University of Chicago says, well, we can give you a 70% chance that we'll be able to cure you. And you won't, there will be no surgery. You'll be fine. You'll get right back up and running. He's like, well... I'll take that. And so he does their procedure, and he comes out, and he's fine, but he loses all of his taste. And then what happens is, slowly but surely, his taste buds start coming back. And so the experiences that we all have as little kids of, like, tasting strawberries for the first time and stuff, he gets to experience that as a grown man who's the head chef of literally the best restaurant in the country. And so not only does this experience like teach him things, it makes him a better chef. And so he goes through this darkness and he comes out the other side. And there's a little bit of frustration on my part because I'm still stuck in act one. And I don't have the other half of this. I don't know where God is taking us. I don't know what this is going to look like. But I do know this is that no matter what happens here, one day it'll all make sense. And one day I'll be able to look back on it and think, I'm glad that happened. I'm trusting God that he knows what he's doing. And when I bristle at the story that God is telling in my life, it's because somewhere deep down, I think I could tell a better one. And so I'm learning to trust that he is in control, and I am not, and that's okay. I know he can use my situation for good, and I know he's going to use it for Lakeside's good as well. I don't know who the next lead pastor is going to be here, but I'm sure he's going to be awesome. I know that God is not done here. I know that the best is yet to come, and I wish I could be part of it, but I trust that he knows what he's doing. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that no matter what comes our way, no matter what the enemy throws at us, that you are able to take it and parry it and turn it for good. That we can trust you because you are sovereign and you are in control. And so, Lord, I pray this morning that you would allow us to feel everything that we feel. but that we wouldn't mourn or grieve without hope. That we would feel all of the sadness, that we would feel all of the 
the pain that comes with this, but that we would experience it with a dose of hope that knows that you are in control and knows that you only want what's good for us and will bring that about no matter what happens to us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.